Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. We are grateful to you for being such amazing listeners. Thank you for your continuous support. While we record new podcast episodes with your favorite GPCR scientists, let's spend some time revisiting previous episodes as we enter the end of 2023 and we start a brand new year. We wish you and your families happy holidays and a wonderful new year. We're currently working on the Dr. GPCR University to provide you courses and content on all aspects of GPCR research to support our community. Our first course will be held live on Zoom starting February 8th, 2024 by none other than Dr. Terry Kinakin. For more details, including the registration information, the specific dates and topics covered, go to the ecosystem at drgpcr.com slash ecosystem. Spots are limited to 20 participants. And if you decide to join us, you'll get a one year complimentary Dr. GPCR ecosystem membership. Become a Dr. GPCR ecosystem member and enjoy rewatching all the Dr. GPCR recorded talks during the summit and the symposium. You'll also get access to the video casts of our podcast, and soon you'll have access to a great collection of Dr. GPCR University courses. You can also member, message members privately, network with your community worldwide. We now have launched a monthly payment option for your premium membership. Renew your Dr. GPCR membership for 2024 with a more comfortable option. Are you looking to hire? Are you looking for a job? We've got you covered. Contact our Dr. GPCR chief matchmaker, Mark Schmeisel, to help you either hire the ideal candidate for your company or help you find your next job. I sp sat down and spoke with Mark directly uh, in episode 55 of the, of the Dr. GPCR podcast. If you'd like to get to know him better, go and re-listen to this podcast episode. You can also reach out to Mark at drgpcr.com slash jobs. And now let's dive into this episode. Hello everyone, Yamina here. We are recording today episode 100 of the Dr. GPCR podcast. And today I have with me many guests, which is unusual, but we are here to remember Dr. Marc Caron. And today I have with me as a co-host, Dr. Kathleen Caron. I'm excited to have you on on board. So Kathleen, why don't we start with you as an introduction and then we can go around the virtual room we're in today. Great. Thank you so much, Yamina. And thank you for the, this, you know, wonderful assembly of, of uh, colleagues and friends and, and family, frankly. Um, so uh, I'm Kathleen Caron, uh, Mark Caron's uh, eldest daughter, um, also representing our family, my, my sister, Melissa, and my brother, Nelson. Um, and we're here today um, to have some conversations and celebrations about Mark and, and his contributions to to our discipline. Um, and I am currently a, a scientist, <laughs> if, for those of you who don't know, and I'm a professor and chair of the Department of Cell Biology and Physiology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which is a large basic science department. Um, and um, uh, we're, we're all going to go through and introduce ourselves very briefly um, and, and mention when we first met Mark. Um, I met him on July 17, 1970, um, when I was born, and shortly thereafter met many of you. And so I, I have had the pleasure and honor um, of knowing most of you almost my entire life. So it's really wonderful to have you here. Um, so let's go around uh, the, the my screen. I'll just uh, pick and then what, after you introduce yourself, you pick the next person. And that, so Jeff Benedict is the first on my screen. Jeff. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jeff Benevic. I'm a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Thomas Jefferson University. Uh, and I first met Mark when I did a rotation. I did my PhD at Duke University in the biochemistry program and uh, did a rotation in the fall of 1981 uh, in Bob's lab and met Mark during that rotation. And he really guided me through a lot of the work during my rotation, but then for the next eight year period uh, when I joined Bob's lab. Uh, so I'll talk more about that later. Uh, Frederick? Okay. Uh, yes, my name is Frederick Lee Blundberg, and uh, I'm a professor in uh, the Department of uh, Experimental Medical Science in the Faculty of Medicine at Lund University in Lund, Sweden. So, um, and I've been 
here since 2002, and before that, I was a professor in Texas uh, at the UT Health Science Center in San Antonio. Uh, so I met Mark uh, the first time when I came over for an interview. I think it was in May of 1982, mm -hmm. uh, and and um, and then of course. Uh, uh, I was allowed to come back in August and continue my postdoctoral uh, uh, work there uh, with Bob and Mark, and and uh, and uh, I I worked closely with with Mark for all the four years that I was at uh, at Duke. So uh, I think David, do you want to go? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Sibley. I'm a senior investigator at the uh, uh, National Institute of Neurological Disorders of Stroke at, at NIH. Um, I uh, vividly remember uh, meeting Mark when I was a graduate student uh, at UC San Diego in the spring of 1979. Um, Mark was uh, presenting a, a poster at the Endocrine Society meeting that was in Anaheim, California, and the topic was uh, dopamine receptor binding in the anterior pituitary gland, which happened to be the uh, topic that I was just beginning to work on as a graduate student. So my advisor, Ian Kreese, and I thought we would drive up to Anaheim for the day to check out Mark's poster, which we, we did. Uh, had a very interesting discussion. Um, it actually was uh, kind of funny because we were seeing GTP sensitivity of agonist binding uh, to the D2 receptor in the pituitary gland. We didn't know what that meant because the D2 receptor wasn't supposed to be linked to adenyl acyclase. Um, but anyway, uh, we had actually went out to lunch with, with Mark and had a really good discussion, uh, very friendly meeting. Uh, and uh, later on, I, I met Mark again at a, a catecholamine Gordon conference and, and asked him whether or not um, it might be uh, advisable to uh, write to Bob to see if I would be a, acceptable as a postdoc in the laboratory. And Mark encouraged me to do that. And I did that a year later. Um, and as we say, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Michelle. Thanks, David. So, hi, everyone. I am Michelle Bouvier. I am a professor of biochemistry and molecular medicine at the University of Montreal and the general director of the Institute for Research in Immunology and Cancer at the same university. And I first met Mark when I came to interview with, with Bob uh, for a postdoctoral position. Bob told me, there's someone here which would like to meet you. Uh, you know, as a French Canadian, I guess uh, there was some already some close links that we could make uh, one with another. So it immediately it was, I would say, love at first sight. It was, it was a great meeting with, with Mark. And uh, and then uh, when I came with my trailer in the back of my car, moving from Canada, uh, who was in the parking lot of the Holly Hills apartment to introduce me to my apartment that he had rented for me was Mark. So, and from then on, we had an incredible good relationship uh, during my stay in, in Bob's lab. I have fun memory of the meetings in, in Bob's office, you know, brainstorming about all kinds of things. And then when I returned to Canada, it was, of course, very helpful in many instances. And we kept a very close uh, friendship throughout the years. So let's go with the, the next one, Rick Cerione. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Rick Sirione, a.k.a. Rocco. I, um, <laughs> I uh, am a professor in chemistry and chemical biology at Cornell, and I first met Mark in uh, 1982 when I came to uh, interview for a postdoc with Bob. And, um, you know, Bob was telling me that uh, Duke was going to be great in basketball again. And Mark uh, told me he could get me uh, season tickets to Cameron, which he did. And so that sold the deal and um then this <laughs> everyone says the rest is history <laughs> oh sorry um who's um bob <laughs> yeah so my name is bob lefkowitz and uh i'm a professor of medicine and biochemistry at duke 
also an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, I guess Kathleen's the only one on the call who's known Mark longer than myself. Uh, Mark joined my lab in the summer. I'm going to guess August. I might be off plus or minus a few weeks. August of 1973. And he had in common with several other people uh, on the call, at least uh, Brian and looking around Lee, uh, these were all postdocs in my lab who, to the best of my recollection, I never met face to face before the day that they actually walked into my lab to work. And each one of those is a story which we may or may not get to uh, later on. Uh, and uh, that's basically uh, basically my story. Uh, let's see uh, uh, who hasn't spoken yet. I guess uh, Lee, uh, Brian, uh, either one. Go, Brian. So yes, I was uh, a cardiac. So I'm Brian Kabelka, um, a professor of molecular uh, and cellular physiology at Stanford University. Um, I met Mark in. 1984, I believe it was in February. I was a, a resident in internal medicine looking to become a cardiology fellow at Duke. And uh, I was particularly interested in Duke because it had a, a research option. And so I was interviewing uh, potential labs in, in 1984. Uh, and I went around to a number of labs and I was uh, warned against the Lefkowitz lab. Um, it was uh it was just too big and i'd get lost and uh you know i'd never see bob uh but i, I interviewed anyway not with bob who wasn't there uh but with mark Caron. and um it was just a great experience uh i i really felt that even though i would be the least experienced person in the in the lab that i would have uh at least mark's attention and um I, I subsequently came back for a, a revisit. Uh, Bob wasn't there again, uh, but I visited it with Mark again, and um, that sort of sealed my uh, decision to join the Left Goods Lab. Thank you, Brian. Lee, Lee you're not here. It might be my time. turn. <clears throat> so my name's Lee Limburn. And after retiring as a faculty member at Vanderbilt, I find myself at a small liberal arts, historically black college, Fisk University in Nashville. And I met Mark in the summer of 1973. I think Bob's right. It was August because Mark was wise and came after all the boxes had been opened. <laughs> I was Bob's first postdoc. So <laughs> anyway, so for me, um, my experience with Mark, and we'll share more later, is sort of an extended family member because my PhD work had been highly clinical. And so even though my degrees in biochemistry, frankly, I learned many of the fundamentals from biochemistry uh, from Mark. But we more than that, we had gaboodles of fun. Thank you, everyone, for that, for those kind words and, and those introductions. And I was listening to the years when you met Mark and when you each were in that area. And I was thinking, hmm, I was not born or I was maybe three years old. And I'm so excited that we, we get to, to, to talk about this. So let's go around the room again. And you've all told us when you first met Mark and you've known him for a very long period. And as as Bob mentioned, Kathleen, you're you're the most experienced there. I want us to talk a little bit about what do you think, in your opinion, or how do you think Mark influenced the DPCR field? So, Kathleen, I'm gonna let you go first, and then we can go do the same thing and, and pick the next person. Oh, to speak. Thanks. Well, that's a that's a really lofty question. <laughs> it is <laughs> possible to 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 put uh, to sum up, but um, you know, it, to me. This, this is how he influenced the field. It's all of these people. You know, it, it, there's, you can talk about the single discoveries and, you know, the dopamine receptors or beta arrestin or, or you know, the, these things are discoveries and they're science, but really it's the, it's the community and it's the, the, the scholars and the, just the, this family of people that have been built uh, that, that really 
create an entire discipline. Um, and, and just keeping that, you know, we, we're, we have three podcasts coming because there's epochs of, of people. You know, it's just, it's really remarkable um, to see the, the expansion of lives that are touched and, um, you know, the, this just continuously effusive, positive enthusiasm to pursue science, you know, with, with your whole heart. And just, um, you know, that's something that I think uh, my father taught many of us. Um, and, and it's just so it, it, every corner of the world um, has trainees from, you know, Lefkowitz and Curon Lab um, that, that have been touched and motivated and continue to be um, by that inspiration. So, so to me, it's not a single paper or a single molecule or a single drug. Um, it, it's really, you know, building uh, th this community of people. Thank you, Catherine. So, before, please, uh, before we go around, I just wanted to mention that. I think that's that's such a such a great answer, and just to be, pre, be to attest to that impact. So you mentioned three podcasts. We, with your help, Kathleen, we came up with a list of thirty people, and out of those thirty people, everyone agreed to come and join us for these three episodes. And I think that says a lot. Um, in in that in, for that impact, Bob. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. Yeah. So. To me, Mark impacted several fields at several different stages of his career. But to me, perhaps the most important one was during the first 10 years uh, when we worked very closely together. At that time, there was no such thing uh, as a biochemical approach to studying drug and hormone receptors. It was not a biochemical field of study. It was a field for the physiologist. And so here you had Mark, a uh, freshly minted PhD, and me knowing relatively little about biochemistry. Uh, and we sort of cooked up this plan to try to identify receptors and study them biochemically, for which there was no precedent. Uh, and uh, I think our relative youth, and I would point out that I was, Mark was only three years younger than me. Uh, when he joined the lab, I was 30 and he was 27. Uh, I, today, I have very few postdocs who are that young. Uh, so we were kind of fearless. And I remember vividly attending a meeting in 1974. Uh, I could have been in Vancouver. It was certainly it was in Canada, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it was the international cyclic AMP meeting. Uh, and we had just developed the, the alprenolol binding assays. And I remember we were uh, really very high on the whole thing. Lee uh, was at that meeting. Uh, Rusty Williams came as well. And Mark, I think those were the three people from my lab. And that was a good part of the lab. There weren't many other people in the lab at that time. And I remember sitting uh, together, uh, the uh, the four of us on a bed in, the, in my room or one of the rooms and just sketching plans. And we talked about our excitement, about thinking that now that we had a ligand binding approach, we could actually go after it. Uh, and we sketched a vision together for about the next 10 years of work, uh, you know, how we would solubilize the receptors, uh, somehow purify them, God knows how, uh, and uh, maybe figure out how to reconstitute them, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't look much beyond that uh, in 1974. Uh, but to me, that was one of the most important ways in which Mark influenced everything that came thereafter, namely that you could study membrane proteins uh, like receptors uh, as if they were biochemical entities. And that was that was completely new. That had never been done before. Give up, Lee. How do you remember this meeting? How do I remember it? Yes. <laughs> I don't know if I remember that conversation or think tank at the same time, but I do remember uh, that this was during the window of time where, even back at Duke, the, the current the chair of physiology at that time didn't believe receptors were molecules. He. <laughs> It's true. He would have conversations with you like, why are you spending your life on that? Because 
It's it's a mood. It, it the the drug interacts with the or the hormone interacts with the cell, and then it just changes its mood. You're so, right. uh, or something, you know. Like that. <laughs> I um, yeah. oh sorry, Lee. No, no, I uh, I just because I had a similar experience, and it was in 1982 or three. I mean, all even all those years later, Bob and I were in Italy at some meeting. And, you know, Bob, you know, he was so enthusiastic about, you know, we were going to, you know, do the greatest science ever. And uh, all these British scientists get up and say there's no receptors. And, uh, you know, I was supposed to be like reconstituting a receptor. Then, and I, you know, now I'm starting to panic. And when I got back to Duke, I see Mark and I said, Mark, th these guys don't believe in receptors. And he goes, Rocco, you're an Italian. I'm a French Canadian. Are we going to listen to a bunch of boring Brits? <laughs> we push forward. Anyone else who wants to chime in? Go ahead, Scoop. No, go ahead, Scoop. Go ahead. I'll say a, a little bit. So, I me, mean, what Bob said about the discoveries uh, that Mark. Uh, really made in the in the 70s when he was initially a, a trainee and then left and came back as a junior faculty member those really from my perspective they drove helped to drive the field uh because it was focusing on one primary receptor the beta adrenergic receptor uh and it set the stage for everything or at least a, a majority of the of the research that was going on in the lab in bob and mark's lab in the 80s, okay, and it certainly influenced everything I did uh, during that period. So, and I think that receptor, I mean, we're not the other, the other one, but the beta receptor really was the model and it ended up driving ultimately the cloning of GPCRs, uh, the really understanding the mechanisms that regulate GPCRs, uh, and Mark really played a central role in, in every aspect of that. In the way, at least during the 80s, when um, it was really run as a joint lab, Mark had his own group on dopamine receptors, but it was it was a small group. But Bob and Mark really worked together seamlessly, uh, overseeing everything that was going on in in that laboratory. Uh, and obviously, a lot of good people there, but really uh, an incredible amount of science. So I think that drove the field. Obviously, Mark made major impacts on monoamine transporters and dopamine receptors and, and many other things. But that that really started the field from my perspective. Yeah, I just want to jump in and say that was one of the reasons why I, you know, wanted to come to Bob's lab was, um, you know, the, the purification uh, techniques, especially the affinity chromatography uh, approaches, uh, really was what what drove the field at the time, as as you all said. But I remember a paper. I think it was it was Robbie Shore was the first author in JBC. It was purification of the frog erythrocyte beta receptor in 1981 or something like that, uh, which was a phenomenal piece of biochemistry. And I thought that you know this is where I want to do a postdoc. Um, and uh, of course, when I got there, Jeff was working on the uh, mammalian uh, purification work so um yeah really phenomenal so just yeah, like to echo some of of what kathleen has said to begin with and i'll come back to some of the science after but i think the impact that mark had on the community is, is tremendous not only the one that he touched directly because he was working with them in the lab or, or become collaborator later but in meetings what what always struck me from Mark in meetings. He was asking very good questions, but not only was he asking very good questions which were insightful, he was doing it always in a way that made the person who was giving the talk or presenting the poster look good. So the intention behind the question was not only getting the answer, of course it was, but it was also to encourage the person to continue his endeavor in science and also make it realize to everybody in the room that the contribution that this person had just made was important for the field in general. So I thought this was always very striking to me. And the other thing I'd like to say, which is also, I think, quite unique to, to Mark, is that Mark not only had influenced his own research program, 
but I'm sure Bob would agree it had a major influence on Bob's research program simultaneously. So these two things, of course, started in Bob's lab, but then you know he maintained the relation, a very close relationship with Bob's lab and having his own research activities. And that was mentioned on the transporters, the dopamine receptors. And there's not that many examples of people that can do these two things at the same time in, in a very generous uh, manner. And, and, and finally, the, the last thing which, had, which struck me and where he influenced the field, I think, is the very close tie he was able to make between concept, questions, and methods, and covering the entire thing, going from biochemistry, then to molecular biology, then to cell biology, then to physiology but paying attention to the methods. And just as an anecdote, I mean, everybody I think would agree with that. No offense, Bob, but when we had a technical question, <laughs> we'd go to Mark. <laughs> no offense taken. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. And just want to point out, you know, that you mentioned uh, being able to ask questions and make the person feel comfortable and really get the answer but also encourage them now I know where you learned that from because I always thought of you as the person who can sit there throughout eight hours of presentations of trainees and ask at every talk a question and make that trainee feel good so now I know Mark is behind behind your ability to ask those questions thank you for that anyone else wants to chime in as to how do you think Mark yeah answered? I Please. Yeah, I, I, I just want to want to say, I mean, you know, uh, I agree with with what uh, everyone has said here, but but uh, so so I I did my PhD studies on not on GPCRs, but uh, on uh, the GABA receptor ion channel complex, and we'd done a lot of radio ligand binding studies, and discovered many many interesting. Um, uh, uh drug interactions uh with this but but i felt like uh i really wanted to know what was receiving that ligand what what was the protein and and um and of course that's that's why i wanted to go to uh to bob and mark's lab and and um even though it was bob who contacted me first i remember the first contact uh I, I had with you, Bob. Uh, you called the lab, and Richard Olson, my PhD supervisor, said, "This is Bob Lefkowitz on the telephone. <laughs> and what does he want with you?" <laughs> and, <laughs> and and I said, "Oh my God!" And so so anyway, uh, so it was uh, you you. Uh, it, it was a very friendly introduction to your group because you said, "Hi, Fred," <laughs> and and. Uh, Anyway, that was before I met Mark, but then I, I, I joined the group. And uh, there are many things that um, I think we're going to talk about later. Uh, that's in segment two and three here. Uh, but I do want to say that uh, Mark, uh, he's a remarkable, he's an experimentalist. He's very good experimentalist. He really knew how to uh, to to get the experiments to work and that is very very important and i think that's and we've all learned from mark how to do experiments and i think that's why we've become pretty good scientists uh and and uh, successful in in working with this very difficult uh, family of proteins they're not easy to work with there there are very few people that really know how to work with these these receptors uh and and um and uh so um so i think that's that's that is uh, uh, a very important part and of course uh i worked on the alpha 1 adrenergic receptor and and purified it and and learned a lot of things from mark uh, so uh i think again reiterating what many of you have said uh it is really how to isolate and then subsequently be able to clone uh these receptors that that uh, mark has has contributed significantly to in this field so just to expand on that the uh this concept uh of being a good experimentalist you know 
something, I don't know who coined it. I often use the term, but I don't know where it comes to EQ, experimental quotient. Uh, all of you learn know that you learn very quickly uh, when somebody comes to work with you, whether they have a high or a low EQ, by which I mean just what you were referring to, just a raw ability to make experiments work. Uh, and, you know, we sometimes say, well, does he or she have good hands? Which, of course, completely misplaces the emphasis. The hands are controlled by the head. Uh, and being a terrific experimentalist is not a matter of, uh, you know, how good your hands are. But Mark had a very, very high EQ and a very, uh, an amazing ability to translate a question into just the right experiment, which is another whole art unto itself. Uh, the other thing I just want to point out about Mark that was uh, such an important thing on the impact he had on all of us was something he shared with me, which was uh, the power of belief uh, from the beginning. Neither he nor I ever really seriously doubted that we would succeed in all the major goals that we took on one by one. I think the only moment of doubt uh, that I had in my whole career uh, was later on during the cloning phase, when I think for the first time, Brian pulled that out of the fire. Uh, but other than that, there, no, no matter what we encountered, I mean, Mark and I always believed it was just a matter of time. It wasn't a matter of whether we would get a radio ligand. It was just when. It wasn't a matter of whether we could solubilize it. just a matter of when. It wasn't a matter of whether we could develop an affinity. I mean, at every stage of the game, he was totally in, uh, as was I, in terms of that belief. And I think that belief is something he would transmit uh, to others. And again, I think when my belief would uh, waver, he'd get me going and vice versa. Uh, and I think all of us, you know, shared that uh, sense of ultimate optimism, even when things looked bleak, you know, day to day, week to week, even month to month, or in some cases, year to year. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Bob. Brian, you had a, please feel free to interrupt each other. It's really a, and as interactive as you want it to be. Uh, Lee, you raise your hand first, and Brian, you one second. <clears throat> so I was going to follow up, well, on all comments, really, but Mark, uh, Michelle Bouvier specifically, one of the things that made working in Bob's lab so wonderful early on is that the field was highly competitive. There were people like Levitsky in Israel who found joy <clears throat> in trying to suppress everyone else and find the fault in their experiment instead of the strength. And then there were there's a crowd at the NIH who had similar joys. <laughs> but what Mark was always in the lab and in that microenvironment, non-competitive in a highly competitive field. That was you were it didn't matter that we weren't doing the same experiments. He was my cheerleader. I think sometimes I was his cheerleader. And uh, he was always supremely helpful. So I still, I don't know if you can see this little sucker. So I still keep this on my desk. This is a cut off 12 by 75 plastic tube with a wire wrapped around it and masking tape that Mark made for me because scooping out one gram of alumina for each of a hundred cyclase columns, he thought could be automated at least a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just keep that treasure to remind me of the, of the sheer joy of working with Mark. I mean, we had some funny 2 a.m. cold room stories too, and maybe we'll get a chance to get to one or two, but I doubt it. But but I think that uh, his ability to find the positive, which lifted you up and made you keep banging your head against that proverbial brick wall was, was really unique. Definitely want to hear about those 2 a.m. Uh, cold room stories. Uh, Brian, <laughs> please go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned, when I came into the lab, I was you know, very inexperienced ultimately uh, became part of the cloning team. And the lab had no expertise in cloning at the time. Uh, and I, I made a few trips to Mark to, to learn basics. But when I came back, um, Bob gave me the, 
to go ahead to try to set up the cloning lab. And it, we made so many more, so many um, you know, sort of stupid mistakes uh, in, in, the, in our effort. And I would, after every failed experiment, would, would go to Mark. And um, even though he, you know, he wasn't a, a, a trained molecular biologist, he always seemed to be able to come up with um, this, the right approach to the next experiment. And what I think I really learned from Mark uh, then and, and subsequently was how to, how to troubleshoot. Uh, you know, invariably experiments will go wrong, uh, but if you don't understand why they went wrong, then they were a complete waste of time. And uh, I, I just remember, you know, I was uh, getting good counsel from Mark in terms of, you know, planning experiments that he, you know, really uh, wasn't necessarily an expert in, but he knew how to solve problems. And uh, uh, I, I thought that was a, you know, a particularly important trait as an experimentalist. You know, another thing that relates to that that was characteristic of Mark uh, was his adventurousness and what I call technical courage. Uh, what Brian says is true. Uh, the lab had never done molecular biology before. But the fact of the matter is we had never done anything that we did before. I mean, none of us had ever done any of that. Mark had never done any of that. I mean, uh, you know, we'd never purified a receptor, developed a radio ligand, developed definitive chromatography, uh, none of it. Uh, and then came the cloning, which was sort of the next thing that none of us knew how to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, with people like Mark, Brian, and the rest of the group here, uh, somehow you figured it out. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Hey. Please, Fred. Yeah, yeah, I just want to say one thing. Uh, of Another thing, and I don't know what segment it falls into, but but uh, the segments, one thing I'm sorry, I just want to mention the segments are not important. This was just to give you an <laughs> idea. So any anecdotes you have, anything you feel like talking about, any two a.m. cold room stories, please feel free. Don't don't inhibit yourselves. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to mention. Uh, uh, of course, we were also iodinating. Uh, uh, the radio ligands that we were working with. I worked with heat. Uh, so we were making I-125 heat and, and we were in there. And then Mark came in and he started to iodinate also. And I said, Mark, you know, why are you in here? You're not, you're, you know, sort of, you're sort of the supervisor here. <laughs> no, no, I, I have to do this because I have to justify my name on the paper. <laughs> He was a true player coach. <laughs> really, really. Well, I, I just want to, I'm going to have to leave it at some point, as I mentioned earlier. So, but I, you know, one thing I wanted to emphasize, because I can't remember what the segments are, but, you know, Mark was not only really a great scientist, but he had a great heart. He was so decent, you know? And so when I was, um, when, and I don't know if Kathleen remembers this, but when I was in the lab, you know, I was single, I didn't have a family, and Mark used to worry about my nutritional status. Um, <laughs> and my mother, was, too. My mother you know, was very, you were very thin. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and I wasn't much of a cook, so Mark would uh, have me over to have dinner with the family and be Pauline and Kathleen, Melissa, and Nelson. But, you know, Pauline always had vegetables. And I wasn't much of a vegetable eater. And it was always broccoli. You know, and I really didn't like broccoli, you know. So, you know, I had a few dinners. And um, and then, you know, Mark would say, well, you want to come over for dinner tonight? And I'd say, I don't know. I'd come up with some excuse. And he goes, Rocco, why don't you want to come for dinner? I said, well, you know, I, uh, I, really, you know, I don't like vegetables that much. He goes, okay, we'll solve this. I'll give you a nudge. Sit next to me. And we'll take care of it. So I went to dinner again, and Mark kind of pokes me. And when uh, Pauline wasn't looking, I'd throw some of the broccoli on Mark's plate. And Mark, Mark would eat my broccoli for me because you know, Pauline was determined. And I would set a good example for the kids. And I was the worst example setter you could imagine. So. Funny. Good story. So I think uh, looking at some of the other prompts, um, I, one of the ones that, that I think would 
be great is to throw out some some adjectives, um, and and that's related to sort of the top three qualities um, and and th that you could think of, and and I'll share some, you know, so dad was a great dad, right? Um, and but I'll share with you some things that kind of transgress between his family life and, and his work life. Um, in, in my th my three things, um, the the work ethic, and many of you have spoken about this, you know. Uh, 2 a.m. was the norm, um, and uh, so it, it was routine in our family life that dad would come back home around 5.30, my mother upset because the dinner's getting cold, and we would eat as a family, with, and, and Rick would join us, and, and, <laughs> and we'd sit and, and, you know, have dinner as a family, and then every night, invariably, it never failed, dad would go back to work and go back to the lab. And there were some nights, especially in the summer, that that we would uh, go to the Duke Faculty Club. There, it was there was a swimming pool, and so the you know the three of us were there. And there are many many nights when Dad, on his way home, would forget us there. You know, to, to the great discouragement of the manager of the Duke Faculty Club, because there were these three children. You know. Just abandoned. You know, the lights are the lights are going off in the parking lot. It's pitch black, and we're just there, and, we're, and we just said, "No, it's fine. He's still in the lab. It's he'll be here eventually." You know, and so so this was kind of our life. You know, that that the lab came first, and and not that we didn't, but you know, we understood, and and we were raised with this remarkable work ethic of the importance of you know, that contribution and, and, and being in lab and, and, you know, dedicating oneself to work. So work ethic was something that that, that Mark really uh, nailed really well. Um, and, and Rick has talked about, you know, the, the human, the human aspect, just the, just being a, a human. And, uh, you know, to me, I look at all of you and, you know, as, as Mark's daughter, I, I know your personal lives, you know, I, I know your children. And, and, um, and, and this is because dad taught me these things, you know, and, and so I, we know you and, and the, the epochs of people through the lab um, personally. And, and that's because dad didn't view the postdocs and the students and as, as, you know, factories, but rather human beings and people. And, and I think bringing that level of humanity um, to science and a very competitive field is really important. Um, and then he was humble. You know, he didn't like the attention. He would be blushing right now if he knew we were doing this. Um, he, he, you know, very, very humble um, and, and always ready to give, you know, the credit to others. Um, and, and I think that that's something that he shared with us, his children. Um, you know, to lift up others. And, uh, but any, if any others have, you know, three qualities or adjectives that you might think of? That, that well, I just want to give you another vignette on the uh, work ethic uh, thing. Just another vignette that uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate. So uh, several of, of my kids and your family, Kathleen, were the same age. And I have this recollection of, uh, I, I don't know whether it was when one of the, whether the, when the kids were either in Gittins Junior High or, or whatever the high school was, uh, Jordan. But uh, anyway, somebody from your family and somebody, one of my kids were in school. And there was some kind of performance going on, uh, music or choral or I don't know what. And it was being held in the gym. So, uh, you know, I got dragged by uh, your Arna and uh, I guess... Uh, Pauline got, Mark got dragged by Pauline uh, on a weeknight of all things uh, to go to this performance. I mean, I can assure you we, we both had other things that we were interested in doing, but okay, we were dutiful uh, fathers, we would go. So uh, I got there and it, it was a gym and you sit on bleacher seats and, uh, you know, I was, my mind was elsewhere, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, then across the this is before things started. Across the way, Jim, I see Mark and, and Pauline sitting there. So I said, oh, I'll go over and schmooze with Mark for a minute. So I go over, and here's Pauline. I say hello. Mark's sitting down. He's working on a manuscript. He has a pad. Okay, I'm not kidding you. In the gym, uh, waiting for the choral performance to begin. And he was actually editing a manuscript draft. Uh, so I remember thinking to myself, geez, I thought I had a work ethic. But this is this is a whole different uh, level of, of endeavor and commitment. Uh, you know what he taught me? When I go watch Sophia play volleyball, 
I edit my manuscripts while I'm watching my daughter play volleyball. <laughs> okay, so, so you you learn that the lesson. Has on. <laughs> but watch yourself when you do that because I did a lot of editing beside the soccer field for my son. Problem: I cheered for every goal, Eric's goals, Eric's competitor goals, because <laughs> I couldn't keep the game straight. <laughs> <laughs> just be, be something that links the is humanity, generosity, and work ethics. Just an anecdote. Uh, it was my first, first author nature paper in Bob's lab. I was supposed to go on a trip to a meeting that Bob didn't want to go, probably, something like that. And the galleys come back. And this is the time when you were correcting galleys directly on the galleys. I mean, there was no such thing as doing that on the computer figures to be changed with letter sets and, you know, that kind of, you know, sort of very old kind of doing things. And then I'm all despaired because I need to go. The plane is leaving the next day. The galleys have arrived and, you know, they have to be returned in 48 hours. And I'm like, what are we going to do? And Mark says, don't worry, Michelle. I'll take care of that. <laughs> and so Mark just did the galleys. You know, he was a co-author, but, you know, I was supposed to be the first author who was responsible for this. Just don't worry, it's going to be taken care of. So generosity and at the same time, the work ethic was 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 there. And talk about traveling, if you want another quality, he was a great traveler. <laughs> he, he, he was not worried. Well, he traveled a lot, first of all, but he was not worried about the traveling. And I have a few memories, but just one. No, an overseas flight. We're tired. We're getting in a big city. I don't remember Copenhagen, Paris. I don't remember. And I'm thinking, let's take a cab, right? To go to no, 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 no. public transportation. Let's take. Well, you know, <laughs> we're tired. We just want to go to bed. But he knew all the things. He knew the subway. He knew how to get from place to place. So he handled traveling extremely well. Michelle, I don't know if you recall, he carried maps of the major subway systems in cities like Paris and London and God knows where else in his attache case. So he was always ready. Uh, and this was one of many characteristics of Mark that I envied, uh, but could never succeed in emulating. One was his ease as a traveler. I was always a terrible traveler, uh, always caused me great anxiety. That hasn't changed uh, to this very day. Uh, another one, uh, was his ability to never steam rushed. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he he would he would give you his time pretty much until you signaled you you were done. I mean, he would never cut you short. And I can tell you that continued right up to the end. Uh, you know, his office was right down the hall from me, and so at my age, I was heading down to the bathroom multiple times in an afternoon. Uh, and each time, back and forth, I'd go by his office. I'd say a couple of times a week for no reason other than just to schmooze. If I saw there was nobody in the office, I would just pop in. And no matter what he was doing, and he was always doing something, he would just turn around and we schmooze. And when I was done talking, and he, leave, but it was never a time. I can't remember a single time where he said to me, Bob, I'm busy. Uh, can we take care of this later? Or I've got a deadline. Nothing. I mean, he was always there. Always give you his ear. Uh, and you know, they talk about these uh, psychological types, type A, type B. I'm the classical type A, driven, always in a rush, very time conscious, competitive. And then there's type B, which is supposedly the opposite uh, of all those things. Mark was an interesting subtype in that he was a hybrid. OK, he was obviously driven, competitive. Uh, a lot of the type A characteristics, but without the negative stuff about always being in a rush and feeling pressured, et cetera. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, that, that that's really the ideal blend. But yeah, try as I might, I was never able to emulate that uh, sort of grace under pressure uh, attitude that he had. He was a biased agonist. He was indeed. <laughs> Absolutely. That he was. Yes, that he was. Yes, speaking of the traveling, uh, it's true. He traveled a lot, and uh, it was it was always very surprising to to us as children that that Dad knew the people at Raleigh Durham International Airport by first name. Um, he he knew all of the travel folks behind the desks, and 
at the holidays, he would bring them gifts. And uh, I, I once traveled and what happened to be at the American Airlines desk and the woman takes my passport and I was traveling internationally. And she looks up at me and she goes, oh, you're Mark's daughter. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, like when you know everyone in the airport by first name. <laughs> yes, he did travel a lot, and but I think he really enjoyed it. Um, just an anecdote on, on that. Um, I remember coming back, back from a meeting in Italy uh, uh, with Mark, and um, we were on uh, TWA, I think, and uh, it may have been in Rome. And uh, he was in business class, and I was in economy class, and we checked in together. And um, he knew the person behind the desk, and he talked her into upgrading me to business class. So. We were able to return uh, back from Rome to New York in business class. It was really remarkable. So <laughs> you know, he really didn't know everyone on the airlines. So, yeah, I, I just want to mention talking about traveling. <laughs> uh, and, and it's something related to the trust he had uh, in us. Uh, and and uh, I have to tell you my personal experience. And that was when when Mark and Pauline went to Japan uh, on a long trip. I think it was for a month. He asked my wife and I, uh, can you look after the kids? <laughs> so... We uh, had a blast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we stayed in, in, in uh, your house, Kathleen. <laughs> Uh, uh, for about a month, and uh, you were a, you were a a teenager. I don't know how old you were, fourteen, fifteen, or something like that, and and wanted to take care of your own business. So we saw you once in a while, but we saw Melissa and Nelson a lot. Uh, so uh, so uh, it was it worked out really really uh, well, I think. We survived, didn't we? We did. We did. The kitchen caught on fire. Do you remember? We did. We set fire to the oil. To the kitchen. It's okay. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you know, that that that's another part of the... He was such a humanist. He was so kind. He was so... Uh, in so in so many ways. And, and we got to know him beyond science. As, as a true, good, a good person. Another so. characteristic we haven't mentioned is self-reliance. He was a remarkably self-reliant man. Uh, again, the mirror opposite of myself. I was always surrounded uh, by assistants. Uh, and through much of my career, I had two full-time assistants. Uh, and Mark never had any. Uh, he would use a pool of uh, departmental uh, secretaries if he needed help with something like that. But he, he handled all his own travel, his own travel arrangements. Uh, now, this did have a downside. Uh, I, I remember on one occasion, I can't remember all the details, where he was going somewhere to give a talk. And I guess he got the date screwed up. Uh, he was only off by one, I think. So he got there. And nobody was expecting him. I mean, you know, his seminar was like on Friday uh, and he shows up on Wednesday. He just had the dates right. I can't remember whether he flew home and then went back or whether he just hung out there. But, uh, yeah, he handled pretty much handled all his own travel amongst many other things. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that. Anyone else wants to share three top qualities that you think made Mark? So uh, let me... Man? Let me, let me mention one other thing. When, unlike um, everyone else on this call, um, I'm probably the only one who has been a was a longtime competitor of of Mark, working on dopamine receptors. Not only as a graduate student, but then during my entire career at the NIH. Um, and uh, you know, Mark was a great competitor, and it speaks a lot to his heart because. Um, unlike the Levitsky style of competition that Lee mentioned earlier, uh, it was always a very friendly competition, uh, one in which we were always willing to help each other out. Mark was willing to send me uh, research materials, uh, 
clones, you know, antibodies, mice, uh, even though uh, he knew that, uh, that, that I was competing against him on, on various projects. Um, and I think that tells a lot about just what a good man Mark was, and uh, I, I was honored to, you know, compete against him in the field of dopamine receptors. So um, I thank him for that. You know, this, this attribute of how decent a person Mark was, uh, I'm sure many of you saw the little uh, obit, if you will, that I wrote uh, in, uh, because it was Nature Neuroscience. And uh, in it, I wrote that Mark was perhaps the most decent human being uh, I had ever met. Uh, but I, in the draft that was submitted, I said that he was the ultimate mensch. Uh, I'd like to think that everybody on this call, uh, having worked with me, knows what a mensch is, knows that Yiddish word. But the editor took it out. She said that uh, she was concerned with the international readership uh, of nature journals, that there would be uh, people from a variety of cultures who would not understand the word mensch. I couldn't really argue that point until the term was deleted. Uh, but amongst us, I would just say he was the, the most ultimate mensch uh, that I ever had the uh, privilege to know. Okay, great. Yeah. So let's um, segue a little bit into a, another uh, question or another prompt, if you will, um, to tell us about a time when Mark played a key role in your success. Um, and I, I'm putting, I, I can't put myself on the spot right now because it's basically my whole life um, in, in so many ways, um, you know, as, as a mom and uh, the, uh, just a scientist and a good human being, I, I hope, I try, um, I try to live up to, to, to that example. Um, but um, Jeff, do you, do you have, want to kick us off yeah, on something? Sure. Or putting you on the spot? <laughs> yeah, sure. Or anything else that you're more comfortable yeah, with? Yeah, you know? no. Um, well, so when I when I joined the lab, uh, my project that was given to me was purifying the beta receptor from the mammalian system. And obviously, I ran into a number of problems. Uh, Mark was always there. And the initial problem was was uh, receptor appeared to be proteolized. Uh, and actually, the only way that we figured that out was because there were uh, development of photo affinity ligands for the beta receptor, which allowed us to label the receptor and then run on a gel and see there were multiple bands. And um, there was kind of this um, thinking a little bit by other labs that maybe these were different isoforms. And so we, we met with some of the people in the biochemistry department uh, and uh, really decided that we should try to, uh, that was likely due to proteolysis inhibit the proteolysis, uh, and ultimately we're able to to get it down to one single band uh, from different species. And it was, uh, Mark really played a central role in, in all of that. Uh, and ultimately that allowed us to, to feed that purified receptor into, you know, Rick's work with reconstitution and into the cloning, which, uh, well, to get amino acid sequence, then ultimately Brian took over the cloning aspects. So with, without Mark's really expertise at every step of the way, uh, I don't know that I would ever have been able to, to successfully purify the receptor. Um, so it, it was really critical in the early in the early work. And I guess Brian, you were you were part of that as well. And how, how did that transition go? Well, so I, I was uh... So I was, as, as I mentioned, a cloner, not a purifier. Uh, but um, I, after after the cloning was successful, and I I remember just trying to figure out what what I would do next. You know, what what I could contribute. And uh, I was kind of um, intimidated by the purifiers. Uh, uh, actually, they you know what they were doing was much more challenging. And um, 
And I just remember talking to Mark about, you know, options. And I really was interested in understanding how these proteins work, but I had no, you know, just the thought of, of, of trying to become a, a purifier and, and actually uh, do structural biology was sort of daunting. And I remember a couple of conversations with Mark where he really encouraged me not to just stay in my comfort zone um, and I, that I needed to, uh, uh, you know, if I really wanted to do something uh, that would, you know, contribute something new to the field, I couldn't just continue to do what, what I was doing. I, I would have to learn new techniques. And, and you know, on several occasions, he really helped me uh, both. Uh, Jeff also helped a lot, I should mention, uh, in, in terms of training me in, in biochemistry. But um, <clears throat> I wasn't always comfortable going to Jeff with really stupid questions. Uh, and, and, and Mark was always there. He'd never make me feel, and Jeff didn't either, but you know, I, I just felt somehow more comfortable uh, with, with really, um, I would say, uh, naive questions about biochemistry. Uh, anyway, you know, when I left the lab, I was fairly competent in biochemistry, and I, I, I think he really helped me, you know, uh, in that new career trajectory that took me um, to structural biology. I would just underscore that because I remember very vividly, Brian, just what you were saying that, I mean, up until a certain point, what deep into your time at Duke, uh, you really had had relatively little exposure to the biochemical aspects of the projects. And of course, your big success came with the cloning. And then for a year or two after that, uh, you know, everybody had you pegged at the, as a, the cloner so that everybody wanted your help, whether it was Susanna uh, with the Alpha Ones, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but then my recollection is that, you know, as you prepared to sort of set up your own shop at Duke and then move on to Stanford, you made a concerted effort to learn from Mark and also Jeff all the uh, nuances of receptor purification and biochemistry. And yeah, that was really crucial for your later success because uh, you would take the techniques that we had developed in our group for purifying micrograms and then hundreds of micrograms. And then if we worked diligently for a month or so, a milligram of receptor, none of which would have been sufficient for your purposes. And by meticulously deconstructing the, uh, the procedures, how the affinity chromatography column was made, how it was alluded, mm -hmm. many different steps along the way, you were able to scale that up to the 10 milligram Stage. And that was what was, at least in my understanding, one of the real keys uh, to your ultimate success in this, in the uh, structural biology arena. But I think that was made possible by what you learned from Mark uh, about the uh, the essentials of receptor biochemistry. Rick, I know you have to leave very soon. I'm going to put you on the spot and maybe ask you um, about a time where, where Mark played a key role in your success. Well, other, I mean, than the, so, other than the broccoli story, or in addition to the broccoli story. Right, well, the, the broccoli story was important, though, to my success, because I did ultimately learn how to eat vegetables at some point. Um, <laughs> you, know, it, you know, one of the things is that he was sort of overseeing, as people said, the biochemistry. It was in 310. I think it was the Sands building. And it was me and Jeff. And Mark was right across the hall. And, you know, one thing that we really, it was a camaraderie, and it was fun. And, you know, I really, I started to appreciate that you know, having a lab should be fun. You, you should be, you should have, not only should you have success, but you should have fun. And it was really a fun time. But before I leave, I just want to talk, talk about this one story that gets to Mark knowing everybody and everything. And, you know, when I first got there, they were purifying uh, receptors from red blood cells, from frogs. And we used to have this assembly line that was really grotesque. I mean, you get 500 to 1,000 frogs from Mexico, and Mark was like an expert pither. So he would, you know, pith the frog so the frog would be done. But And then someone would open it up, and then they drain the blood, and then you start isolating the red blood cells. And so Mark tried to show me how to do each step. But of course, I failed miserably. I couldn't pith. You know, the frog would like hop away. And, and so finally, he said, okay, you know, what Rocco will do is um, – 
drive the truck. And so what that meant is that they get all the carcasses, put it on this, this thing, and I take it to the basement where they were getting rid of the car carcasses. But the problem arose when they would come, sometimes these frogs would come in on a Friday, late Friday afternoon, and nobody wanted to do this operation on late Friday or come in Saturday morning to start massacring frogs. So you had to keep them at least somewhat alive. And so, again, I was single. I didn't have a family. So I would have to go to the basement of Sands on Saturday afternoon and water the frogs. They would be in these boxes of pizza boxes with holes. And I'd be sitting there watering frogs, you know. And I'm thinking, here I go. I came to this lab. I wanted to do great things. And I'm a postdoc watering frogs on a Saturday afternoon with and half the time, the air conditioning would go out and be hot as hell. So I remember telling Mark, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I just can't water frogs. I got, so Mark goes, okay. <laughs> Somehow he knows the people who are sending the frogs from Mexico, and he gets them to make sure they don't come on late Friday afternoon. So I have to water frogs on, on Saturday night. So, um, you know, aside from all the biochemistry that he knew, and he was a great scientist, we talked about what a great heart he had. He also was really, um, he was really resourceful and traveling and, and, and dealing with the frog people. So I, I just want to say, because I do have to leave, I want to thank you, Amina and, and Kathleen, for this, for including me. I want It's great seeing all of you. If you get bored where you are, you know, it's uh, sunny Ithaca. Uh, you'd always uh, uh, be welcome here. And otherwise, um, have a happy holiday. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Bye. Bye. Bye, Rick. As, as he's logging off, uh, one of my fondest memories as a child on Saturday was to go into the lab and before the frog was pissed, I would get to play with it. And so we would race them down the hall. Bob, I don't know if you remember, but we would have the frogs racing down the hall. Yes, I do remember that. I, you know, we would play with them because why not? It's Saturday afternoon and we're in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, we to try to preserve the health of the frogs for at least the few days that they were there, we looked into, well, what do frogs eat? Uh, and my recollection is we, we there was no internet to look up stuff, but somehow we got in our heads that frogs eat crickets. <laughs> so then we started ordering large quantities of crickets uh, to feed the frogs. Uh, then the question came up, well, how do we keep the crickets going? What do the crickets eat? Uh, but I don't remember how we solved that one. <laughs> yeah. I only remember the frogs coming in and stanking stank, in the mailroom. Yeah. So the mailroom yeah. would call and say, well, we got some frogs who are stanking. Over <laughs> <laughs> then we would dispatch somebody to pick up the boxes, 2,000 frogs. Lee, I really want to hear about that 2 a.m. cold room conversation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, so many a night we first of all, you all know that Mark is was bilingual, right? It's so hard to talk about him in the past tense, by the way. So I'm having trouble with that as we talk. So um, and he had this error notion, just like Brian Kabilka doesn't think he's very hands-on competent in the lab or likes to think that that was once true. Mark used to think that English was something he couldn't read well, speak well, or understand well, which naturally was nonsense. But he also did have an occasional misuse of a word because of that bilinguality. So. We were one night working in the lab, and I'm sure it was two, because that's just when things happened in the lab. And so we're in there, we're working side by side, and he's saying, you know, I'm glad I'm inert, because I spend more time with you than I spend with Pauline. So you know what he meant by inert, okay? <laughs> so that aside, then we realize that the cold room is no longer cold, and it's broken. So before it occurs to us to go and borrow, without his permission in the middle of the night, Pat McKee's cold room next to ours, we decide we know how to make a cold. This is when resourceful goes wrong. So we go get styrofoam boxes full of dry ice from down the hall. And I guess we forgot the CO2 part of dry ice. So about 10 minutes in, we're looking at each other thinking, we do not feel good. 
we really do not feel good. <laughs> so inert Mark and I then took our columns and moved them next door to Pat McKee's Pat McKee's office. But Mark was just fun. You know, just fun. Lee, I believe my recollection is one of you, one of Mark's malapropisms, if I can use that term, or mispronunciations that you used to have a lot of fun with. It's when he, one time he said uh, something could be divided into a third, a third. Oh, and a third. yeah. So, you know, How did that Pauline, come out? yeah. So, Pauline made him wonderful lunches. And Andre de Leon was a cook as well. And he made wonderful lunches. And I was married to a surgical resident. So I was married to a grumpy vegetable who was home about three hours a week. So I didn't have wonderful lunches. So Mark <laughs> Mark was always willing to share a turd with me. And when I left, I made him a little stamp, which, of course, he did not appreciate. But I think he understood I was trying to be funny, not hurtful which was a turd, T-I-R-D, no H, by any other name. Do, 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 do. <laughs> but, but, but the point is that H's are difficult for French Canadians. You know? <laughs> yeah, we all have this little difficulty with this letter. <laughs> maybe, maybe to come back to the, the, the influence that, that Mark had in our career. or You know, mentors are important for many uh, reasons. And each of us had, you know, a few mentors, you know, and definitely Mark was one of my mentors. And one of the things that I do, I'm sure most of us do, is thinking when we have a situation, what would Mark do? You know, and, and, and that's one way by which Mark was extremely important for me, because in particular, when I had a postdoc where a student was spinning his wheels, right? Clearly, it's not working for some reason. And and Mark being what we said before, trying to always to find a good side into the people, you know, I was thinking, what would Mark do with the guy like this, which, you know, nothing is happening. And I was thinking, well, maybe it's because it's the wrong project. And I know Mark would think that way. He would say, oh, my God, maybe it's the wrong project for this person. And if we would switch the question, maybe he could address it. And I must admit, I tried that a few times. It worked some of the times. <laughs> Not always, but it worked some of the time. So, yeah, the influence that Mark had just in thinking, what would he do in such a circumstances was certainly for me a very important aspect of how I was able to succeed in whatever I succeeded. Thank you for that. Anyone else wants to add anything? I think it's a great segue, Michelle, to the last but not least question we have here. What should junior scientists know about Mark, in your opinion? And we can go around the room. Kathleen, I'm gonna hit, put the spotlight on you and let's start with you and you can, we can go from there. Yeah. Uh, what should junior scientists know about Mark? Well, so many things. Um, you have to love science. You have to love it with you know every bone in your body and it just, you have to, it, it's a love affair of, you know, seeking and, and that quest for the truth and for, uh, you know, new techniques and always being on the cutting edge. And you, you just have to be inspired by that and wake up every morning excited um, for that next challenge. And, and that's how you keep yourself young and it's how you keep yourself enthusiastic, you know, because it's hard. And, the, you know, the, we've talked about all the successes, but my goodness, how many failures, right? I mean, how many failures? And so you just, it's having that effusive enthusiasm that just, it has to be at your core. Um, and and though I, I think, uh, you know, dad was good at identifying those people who have that passion, you know, and, and who just have that, that love for science. Um, and, and so... I think that's an important lesson for junior scientists. Like you have to <laughs> love what you're doing every single day, yeah. even, even when it's hard, right? And even when it's failing, you have to love that process. So. Of course, this is where the mentoring thing comes in. So what, what, what Kathleen describes is experiencing one's work as a calling. That is a, a sense that you were really destined to do whatever it is you're doing. 
It doesn't have to be something grand. And we, we, we tend to associate the concept of a calling or a vocation with clergy, but you could do anything could be a calling. If you really feel, feel it, but in most people never have that experience. Now, everybody here uh, on this call has had that experience throughout their life. Uh, but where did that come from? Well, probably the single most important thing in experiencing a calling for most of us was having a or several role models who modeled that for us. And, and you just say, wow, what a way to live. I mean, not to feel that you're working for a living, but sort of like an artist, you're just doing what you do. I mean, that you do it not to earn a living, although that, that's sort of a side product, but I mean, you do it because that's just what you do. And you do it with passion because you love it. Well, yeah, but most people don't have that. Uh, and even people who have careers as opposed to jobs, most of them still don't have that sense. So what that sense comes from uh, is one or more mentors who model it. And nobody did that better or more effectively or more authentically than Mark. Yeah, let me speak to that as well. So, I mean, I think what junior investigators can learn from Mark is how to be a good mentor. Um, and it's not just while someone is in the lab. So, yeah, that's somewhat the easy part. Uh, so he was the person you could go to. He would give you guidance. He would, he if your project wasn't working, he would he would help sort it out, or or you might even think about changing your project. But it's really when you're someone's mentor, it's really for life. Uh, and I think Mark has been someone who's, at least for me, has always been there. Uh, when I've needed his help over the years, uh, sometimes we've collaborated on projects, sometimes we've been competing on project projects, but he was always there for me. And, and I really value that. Uh, and, I, and I think junior investigators should really model themselves after that. They're just starting out, they're just, you know, training people in their lab, but really to take that to heart, that that's, you're, you're helping to guide that individual for the rest of their life uh, and really buy into that. Frederick? Yeah, no, I, Bob, you bring up uh, 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 a good thing, the calling. Uh, and, and that's, that's, uh, uh that that's something that i've learned to always uh, uh tell phd students that come in and want to do work in my lab uh, and uh and this calling uh it it has to be so deep within you in order for you to survive in academic science uh and another aspect also that i've gotten from mark is uh, to dare to jump into the deep end of the pool, you know, to 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 dare to do uh, the diff difficult things. And I, I remember uh, after having been in uh, Mark's and your lab, Bob, uh, for three and a half or four years, uh, uh, I was considering, well, maybe I maybe I should just stay here and. Uh, and uh, I think Bob, you 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 said, yeah, you can stay for a while longer. <laughs> and and uh, and Mark told me he he Mark told me that you have to think about your academic career. Uh, you need to go on. You need to jump in the deep end of the pool. You go on and in order to you know to build your own group and continue. And that is what will satisfy your 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 needs in in the long run so so at least for me this mentoring was uh, we talked a lot about it uh, and how to proceed uh, because being in this group marks and your group was very it was great it was very stimulating it was very a lot of things that's where everything happened but you go to go. You got to go on, and build your own path. And and Mark helped me realize that. Lee, did you have your hand? So, 
One of the the things for junior investigators that Mark emulated so well, and you've all referred to it in different ways, is this whole business of joy. That the passion and the fact that you can't think stop thinking about experiments and designing experiments, there's a joy to that. And, and I think one of the challenges in all these professional development programs these days are emphasizing things like working hard and being willing to be in the lab seven days a week and da-da-da. But all those things happen because first there's joy there. And I think part of Mark's joy that he passed on was in part because of his humility. He was so willing to be silly. So you could be silly together. You know, we'd have moon landings with the gamma counters and put it by the little battery on the side to make still it was, and we'd, we'd imitate moon landings in the lab two, three in the morning, just to sort of, we weren't complaining we were there. If we were gonna be there, this could also be fun. And I, I hope Brian um, forgives me for this, but I think Brian caught a bit of that um, that joyfulness because once when Brian and I were later collaborating, I called him and he was late to the phone. Why? Because his lab was having a practice celebration. Do you remember that? Because his project was so long-term, Brian was smart enough to not wait until the end, right? but do some practice celebrations in between. And I just thought that was brilliant. <laughs> so, you know, it got passed down through the generations. Yeah, we, we call it pre-celebrating. Pre oh, excuse me. <laughs> Brian, perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about how did the pre-celebration uh, tradition came to be in your lab? I, I'm not really sure. I, I, honestly, I, I think it um, was partly my wife's idea. But uh, I remember um, during the cloning, uh, we talk about failures. I mean, the cloning was about a year and a half of failures. And uh, I, I think we actually started it in, in the Lefkowitz lab. Um, with uh, little little pre-celebrations because everybody was so depressed, uh, we would um, we would get hits, uh, you know, on our our, uh, our our screens, and you know we'd work them up, and they turned out to be you know nothing. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's all I can I can really remember. Um, it might have dated back to the the left uh, years. And I would often say that uh, during those uh, bleak times, uh, when uh, when we were failing, uh, I would we would frequently get visits from both Bob and Mark, and I don't know whether they did it as a tag team, but um, they sensed the mood was was uh, not so good. <laughs> and they would come in and sort of shoot the breeze and um, you know try to help us troubleshoot, and then. Uh, you know, we felt a little better. Maybe next time we'll get it. Right. Yeah, keeping spirits up is uh, something you really need to do in in the laboratory because, as we all say, it's it's mostly failure most of the time. Uh, so, an optimistic spirit uh, is certainly, and Mark was great at that, or at least transmitting it. Uh, you don't have to feel optimistic in your heart to act optimistic to your trainees. We all know that. Uh, and then, But that's very important. And Mark was very good about that. Continuing on the theme of joy. Yeah, continuing on the theme of joy. Uh, you know, it's not because it's hard, it can be fun. But the the, the one thing, I, I'm not a jealous person I at all, ever. But once I experienced a little bit of jealousy, and this was when the, again, the galleys, the galley story again. But the galleys came back for the nature cloning of the beta-2 receptor. And here they were, Mark, Bob, and Brian. And maybe there was somebody else, but at least the three of them were in Bob's office with scissors and cutting pieces of the galleys from the nature paper and pasting things that they had printed out some on some other piece of papers, trying to get... 
the gal is out within, I don't know, 12 hours, whatever ridiculous <laughs> time frame that they had. So on the one hand, it looked like it was ridiculous, right? These grown up, you know, cutting paper pieces and sticking them onto each other. But then they were having a lot of fun. And I felt, you know, I was just across in the in the lab, just across Bob's office. And they were laughing and they were cutting and they were stitching things. And I thought, I'm missing on something, you know, something is happening in this office. And clearly there was a lot of joy involved in this, clearly. Well, you know, another story, very much of the same piece, but relates to the same tale, was uh, when the cloning was finally successful. So we were coming down the stretch. We were in this big race. We didn't know when this other group uh, it was probably, well, not probably, it was the single most intense collaboration uh, uh, competition I ever remember in my career. And we were competing with the group at Genentech, which were the world's experts in cloning. We had no experience. Uh, and so we were collaborating with the group at Merck, and Brian was leading the effort uh, here at Duke. And uh, as I recall, it came down to the fact, you know, we both groups were working on the uh, sequencing of uh, genomic clones, uh, which were intronless, as it turned out, and which would have the whole open reading frame that we needed. And we were sort of coming from two different ends, and we re we kind of reached an impasse where there was a, a region of, Brian remember better, of so many base pairs that uh, that uh, they just couldn't get at, uh, at Merck. And so we, we couldn't complete the sequence. Uh, and then Brian had some crazy ideas about using ungodly amounts of radioactivity, or I don't remember what. Uh, but so he, he worked on it. And I remember I went home for dinner and he was going to read the uh, whether or not he was able to connect up. And then he called me to say, yeah, uh, we got it. We got the whole thing now. So uh, I immediately said, OK, I'm coming in. I came in. Mark came in. And Brian was there. And we we had, there was a main collaborator at Merck uh, named Seagal Richards. Uh, was it Richard Seagal? Irving. Ir Irving Seagal, right, who tragically died in the Pan Am uh, bombing uh, not, not that many years after. So here we were, the group of us in the in my office, and we it was in the evening, I'll say nine o'clock. And so we called Merck to try to tell Irving Siegel, of course, he wasn't there. In fact, the only person who was there was like a night watchman. Uh, and I said, can you give me Seagal's number, phone number, so we can call him home? He said, I'm not permitted to give that out. I said, well, could you call Irving Seagal? Tell him that uh, Bob Lefkowitz is calling. We have uh, we have important news. And then the, the four of us sat there, you know, all at Twitter waiting. And sure enough, Seagal called. And with great drama and excitement and celebration, we told him. But yeah, that was the, the kind of thing. I mean, that that camaraderie, that spirit that we all shared, uh, and, and just sort of appreciating that moment for, for what it was. Well, great discoveries and great teamwork. So I think we're coming to a close. And uh, I just want to say, uh, personally, on me personally and, and on behalf of Melissa and Nelson, thank you all for being here um, and for contributing. It's just so joyful to see everyone um, and, and have these wonderful recollections and um, of, of what an amazing person Dad was. So thank you so much. And I also want to give a huge thanks to Yamina for her innovation and her you know, leadership in, in, in assembling this and, and assembling this wonderful group of people together. Her, she's done amazing things with Dr. GPCR. I hope that you all subscribe and, and um, participate in that community. It's, it's wonderful for the field. Um, and so Yamina, thank you for bringing us together and thank you to all of you for your sharing uh, joy and, and happiness and, and fond remembrances. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And I was while you were all talking about the stories, the two a.m. cold room. I remember. I it just took me back to the times when I was working in the lab, and I really enjoyed that time. And it was difficult. It was hard. We went from dopamine rush to dopamine rush, and the time between the two dopamine rushes was undetermined. Sometimes years in between. And thank you, everyone, for sharing all your stories, for taking the time, Kathleen. 
wonderful uh, to have you on. Thank you for helping with this project. Um, you've been an amazing co-host. I cannot wait to do the other three podcast episodes. So this is 100. <laughs> we have two other decades to visit. And then Kathleen and I are going to be uh, taking some time and talk in a separate episode. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Any last thoughts? Now is the time. Uh, we're going to stop recording in a second. I would like you to stay on until we stop recording so I can uh, say thank you to you again offline with this. Thanks, everyone. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us and listening to this Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We thank our guest, our Dr. GPCR team members, Attila, Ines, Monserrat, Ivana, Andrein, Valid. Please subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter. Find us on YouTube. And if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com slash testimonials. Join us and sign up for the Dr. GPCR University course starting February 8th with Dr. Terry Kanakin. The deadline for registration is February 1st, 2024. When you register to the course, you will get a one-year complimentary access to the Dr. GPCR Premium uh, membership. I hope you can join us. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. Email us with any questions or suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe.